I will. Thank you. I think uh, given uh, some of Dr. Pricky, some of Dr. Eastler's earlier questions, I might turn to some of the slides uh, that we have here. Uh, let's see if we can find them. Uh, let me start with the one that says groundwater quality standards. That one's fine. We'll start there. Um, it hasn't so much come up this time. It has come up in the past how we, you know, what actually groundwater is as it's defined in statute. And this is the statutory definition that the department has been given to work with. It uh, was put in statute in 1979, so I think it's everybody at this table has no responsibility for it. <laughs> um, you can look at that, and I'll just read it. All the waters found beneath the surface of the earth which are contained within or under this state or any portion thereof except such waters as are confined and retained completely upon the property of one person and do not drain into or connect with any other waters of the state. Uh, there is obviously scientifically a lot to critique about this, that, that pretty much in Maine, in this climate, all of these waters eventually are going to get to a surface water. They may take a very long time to do it, but unless they're chemically bound or structurally bound within the minerals, they're going to eventually end up in a surface water. Uh, there are other things to critique about it, but nonetheless, this is the statutory language that we are given, and so what we do is find ways to make it work, uh, which is important in thinking about some of the other things we're going to talk about in terms of how we work with this definition and the definition we've been given for mining area and other things that become important in translating from the statute into the rule. So if we go to the next one, these are the groundwater quality standards also in statute and Cindy has given you that language but we'll just go through quickly what they are so that we can talk about them. Uh, GWA and GWB are the two standards that we are given for groundwater classification. These are for our purposes, analogous to class A, class AA, class B, class C, and so on. For surface waters, they are essentially criteria that the department uses to determine whether a discharge can be licensed to that receiving water and whether a violation, in other words, an unlicensable discharge has taken place to that water. In other words, if it causes the water to receiving water, whether it's groundwater, surface water, lake water, ocean water, do not meet the standards ascribed to its class, that's a violation of classification and then it's up to the department to pursue that how it over chooses to do so. So GWA is the highest classification of the two and it's of such quality that it can be used for public water supplies. Uh, this groundwater should be free of radioactive matter or any matter that imparts color, turbidity, taste, odor. Uh, would impair usage of the waters other than that occurring from natural phenomena. So to get to a, a point Dr. Easton has brought up, we do know that there are area, large areas in Maine which have elevated concentrations of arsenic naturally. We would not attempt to apply to, or to require somebody to treat that water other than unless they were providing it to someone for drinking purposes just as the result of, of some enforcement action. We know that that ambient water is high in arsenic. But what we would say is where it is already high in arsenic, you can't make it worse than it is. Because what we are expecting as the criteria of that class is where it already doesn't meet a drinking water standard, the standard is as naturally occurs. So if we had a situation as we do in many mining areas where the ambient groundwater has elevated arsenic or other metals, then closure, what we would expect to see is, you know, well, we know you're not gonna get it back to drinking water standards because it didn't meet that to begin with. But we don't want it to see it to be in the end any worse than it was beforehand. Class GWB is suitable for all uses other than public water supplies. Well, what exactly does this mean? Clearly we think that it means that that has to be suitable for support of natural habitat and groundwater dependent environments and, and other functions. Is clearly would be suitable for industrial use. Um, 
Is it suitable for other types of water supplies that might require higher water quality and industrial use? That's, that's kind of ambiguous in the statute. But fortunately, that's never come up because the statute also provides that all groundwater is classified as GWA unless otherwise provided uh, in this section. And there is a means that requires action by, I believe, the board and also the legislature to take a plot of this water and that is classified, currently all classified as GWA and move it into GWB, but that has never been undertaken. So what we're dealing with is all GWA under this system. Um, and putting something into GWB very obviously takes us back to the problems with the definition of groundwater is that, well, okay, so let's say that we have this area that we're gonna define GWB for some reason. Are we accounting in that reason for the fact that that groundwater eventually migrates out of that geographic area we define as GWB? So there, there, are, there are certainly some issues with this, but this is the system that we have worked with for, for quite a long while. So if we go. Radon uh, is pervasive in rocks, and more so in fractured rocks temporarily. So actually, the breakdown of radium and its daughter products giving rise to radon gas is a function of surface area. And so if you basically um, run your tap water, it's from a drilled well in the rock, and it's got a fairly strong concentration of radon in it. You just let it sit there on a table for a while and mix it up a little bit and go watch a TV show, come back, and it's gone because it will very quickly leave that water environment when given the appropriate pathways to get into the atmosphere. But nonetheless, uh, if the rock is, and all rocks remain basically a fraction to a certain extent, so they have any water that's in there sitting there, not going anywhere, uh, and the radon doesn't escape very readily. It sits in the cracks of the rock, and that's it. And then all of a sudden, you open that up to exposure to pathways to go places. You've got now in Class A waters, and B, and all other waters, uh, typically groundwater issues. Uh, and because once you get into a river system or a lake system or whatever, the radon very quickly dissipates into the atmosphere and you won't be able to measure it in, in the water. Yep. Uh, so I just wanted to put that in there because of so you can't have radiation or radioactive materials. Well, you can't not have them. Well, again, that gets us back to the as naturally occurs right. language. Okay. Unless there's a case where somebody is, is disposing of radioactive waste, which again is not allowed in the state. Right. Uh, we're dealing with a situation where radon naturally occurs at a rate that is determined, is, is being formed at a rate that is determined by the physics. Sure. And the abundant, well, the rate is determined by the physics. The, the concentration is determined by how, much, how many minerals you have and how well fractured the rock is. So the radon then falls into our naturally occurring category. It may not be suitable to drink. You may create a problem for yourself by drilling into a fairly tight body of rock and creating some fractures that, allow, that provide a pathway for the radon to escape. But the radon has been forming from minerals that have been in that location for millions of years. And so you're not dealing with a violation of the water quality standard so because then you of have to take into consideration arsenic, which is a big problem for us. We really have no idea. Uh, we can't predict readily where we're going to find a lot of arsenic, and we're not. Right. So the, the geologists in the state have been trying for a long time to do that. It's not easy to do. You can find areas that are heavily loaded with arsenic, and uh, over here, and none over there. Right. And that stuff doesn't go off as a gas necessarily. And if you get it into pyrite, you are, have arsenopyrite, hmm. and any rocks that were devoid of oxygen and more uh, basically reducing uh, minerals like uh, iron sulfide, and you're gonna find lots of iron sulfide in sulfides, and more likely than not, you'll find arsenic in, in trenched in that uh, iron sulfide to make it arsenic iron sulfide or arsenopyrite. Hmm. But anyway, just to keep those in mind, because Somebody else may come and say, wait a minute, there's arsenic. There is a lot of arsenic yes. in many of those rocks that we've been talking about. Anyway, yeah. I don't know what to do about that, but just want to bring that up. No, and certainly, again, that, that goes back to you know what we're looking at in this and also in terms of a reclamation standard that, that arsenopyrite is a very common mineral in, in many of these sulfide ore bodies. 
And so we would expect that as that mineral weathers naturally, you are going to be releasing some concentration of arsenic, as you will of many other metals, to the groundwater, whether there are people involved or not. Uh, we also recognize that the geochemistry will change as a result of the mining operation. What we're looking for at the, at the end of the operation for closure is that you, you effectively are restoring those pre-development geochemical, to the extent practical, those pre-development geochemical conditions such that that volume of arsenopyrite which you have not disturbed is going to go back to weathering at the rate it was prior to the disturbance. And if that results in water that is, if, if that, not results in, but if that still leaves you with water that's unsuitable for drinking, well that's what was there before. It's just that it's not more unsuitable, if you will, that the, the, the concentration of arsenic is not statistically significantly greater than it was prior to your operation that you've done what you've done, but, the, but when we get to closure, it's not worse than it was before. If it already did meet drinking water standards, then you then closure, the closure criterion would be it still has to meet drinking water standards. If it already failed drinking water standards, the closure criterion would be, we recognize that for this particular compound, not, not the whole list of compounds under the sun, most of which it may have met drinking water standards for before, but for these which it failed drinking water standards previously, it can't be worse. So that's the, that's the situation we had beforehand. So here's what the, the effect of, of the mining law does is we have, prior to this, everything is GWA. The mining law creates these little bubbles called mining areas within which notwithstanding that language we just talked about, 465C and 470, notwithstanding GWA, GWB system, there are these areas called mining areas within which discharges to groundwater may occur regardless of what happens, regardless of the concentration of those, regardless of, of anything that in the GWA and GWB language. Discharges can occur within those areas that are defined as mining areas, but those discharges can't result in contamination beyond the boundary of those mining areas. And it goes on to say, actually it says prior to that, in terms of, of defining that, what mining area is. It's an area of land including but not limited to land from which earth material is removed in connection with mining. The lands on which material is uh, from that mining is stored or deposited, the lands on which beneficiating and treatment facilities are located, and, and so on, other characteristics we don't need to read. So what happens as a result of this is we have this area, the, the entire state which, which we've been dealt, dealing with in terms of, you know, meeting standards for public water systems unless that as a result of natural processes it already doesn't. And we have these areas within it that are called, or will be called mining areas, where that doesn't apply anymore. Where in fact, as far as discharges to groundwater is concerned, nothing applies. So as we looked at this, what was clear to us is that what we want to do, recognizing the fact that, that without artificial systems, you pretty much can't isolate groundwater. It's going to migrate out of these areas. And the larger these areas are, the greater a potential problem you're setting up for yourself down the road. What we wanted to do was minimize these to the greatest extent possible. And the statute treats all of these areas and treats all ore bodies. And in fact, what we're mostly concerned with here is sulfide mining. But there are, and there may be in the state, metallic mineral deposits that are not sulfides. We certainly know that mining operations have inert, will remove a large amount of inert rock. And so one issue with this is that the inert rock stockpiles and potentially those metallic operations which are not sulfide deposits would come under this as well. And so they, they simply are rock types which would not present the risk for groundwater discharge. So one issue we have certainly is why are, do those need mining areas? Obviously, even if you have a sulfide-bearing ore body, 
there'll be parts of the facility that are not presenting any potential for generating waste, the access roads, the power lines, maybe a substation that's serving the facility, uh, parking lots, any number of facilities like that that are kind of ancillary to the ore processing and handling and, and waste disposal that don't present a risk for what, what appears to be the intent of the legislature to, to deal with sources of contamination. These areas aren't sources of contamination at that level that a class A or class B waste would be. So our proposal is that those are not mining areas and that the mining areas are, as required by the statute, you are required to establish them by the statute, are basically those areas within which you are actually handling and processing of the ore and disposing of waste materials. So that is the, the essence of what you've seen in several slides here as our bubble approach where we're dealing with very limited bot areas surrounding these, these particular processing. And in, in some cases, it may be effective to combine them together. You may have, and that, that slide that Melanie's brought up shows certainly these as all distinct areas. You may have, and it may be very convenient, for the mill site to be located right adjacent to the open pit, in which case, well, it's really, you know, if, the, if there's no sense to creating a little sliver of land in between them, then we'll combine the mining, we will combine the mining area for mining areas for the open pit and for the mill site. But they may be several miles apart. As, as Mark talked about, the waste disposal locations often are defined by, or ideally located in, on the basis of topography, where you already have a low-lying area that you can use for waste disposal. Again, that might not be near the mining near the, the mine itself might not be near the mill, it might be some miles away. There's really no easy, real reason to define the area in between those two as part of this mining area because you simply aren't disposing of any material in between. Um, many mining operations do police their roads quite well to make sure that they're not losing or, or, or waste product along the roads between some of these, these bodies, because again, if you're using this road a lot, you can, you know, a fair amount of material can end up falling off and being a source of contamination. So what we didn't want to have was to create, an, was to include that area in between these bodies where they're widely separated as an area that falls into this area, where, this region where we, this uh, volume, if you will, where we have no groundwater standards to apply to it. So that is the logic behind having these, these defined bubbles around some of the facilities at the site, but not necessarily all of them, because again, not all of them are handling group A and group B wastes. So we go to the next one. These are standards for discharges, and I'm not gonna read through them necessarily all by themselves. I want to, to, to bring them up here to get to the logic behind some of the monitoring requirements that we have. So there has been some concern about those. What I particularly want to point out is both of these, I'll just read the first one. The mining operation will not cause a direct or indirect discharge of pollutants into surface waters or discharge groundwater containing pollutants into surface waters. It results in a condition that is in non-attainment or non-compliance with the water quality classification program and other standards that, that you already have in your packet. Um, as applied to surface water, what this language means is that all of the existing surface water standards apply. That, that if an area has been designated in the water classification program as AA, no discharges may take place. If it's A, all discharges have to be equal to or better than the water quality and so on. All of that still applies inside and outside of mining areas. It really is only an issue for what's happening with the groundwater inside of the mining area. And that gets us to this idea of direct and indirect discharges and what that means and how we try to capture that with the monitoring program. So let's go to the next one. And this just sort of summarizes what we said, but to go back to what's going on within a mining area, all those existing surface water standards apply. So if you have a stream that flows through or adjacent to a mill site, if you have a wetland adjacent to a mill site, if you have a pond that's adjacent to a mill site, if it's on the ocean, the existing surface water quality standards, the classification for those all applies and all the discharge limits appropriate for that classification apply. There are no standards for discharges to groundwater. 
And groundwater quality has to be such that it doesn't cause or contribute to essentially a, a, a surface water body failing to meet its classification. GWA applies still outside the mining area. Inside the mining area, there are no standards for groundwater, but groundwater has to be of a sufficiently high quality that it can't cause a violation of a surface water quality standard. And that gets us to this idea of direct and indirect discharges, which are the next slide. This is what I think you could fairly clearly call a direct discharge of groundwater to a surface water body. This is a small stream near Pittsburgh. It's a coal mining area. Uh, coal mines frequently have high con or are associated with bodies of sulfide bearing shale, uh, which can be a source, as we see here, of low pH water, uh, elevated metals concentrations. Uh, the Red color is uh, results from a bacterial precipitate of iron oxide and iron hydroxide mostly. Uh, and there's a spring in the background there. It's a groundwater discharge that comes over the top of that ridge and it dumps into the stream. That is a fairly direct discharge of groundwater and obviously is the sort of thing we want to avoid. If we go to the next one, this is a sort of typical slide showing what we call a, the, the hydrologic cycle and, and it's really up here to get to this idea of base flow which uh, is the very very slow frequently very slow uh, process by which groundwater discharges essentially upward into lakes into wetlands into streams uh, as we see in in, you know, in southern Maine certainly right now pretty much everything that's in a stream is base flow it's all groundwater that is seeping upwards into the stream. And it is typically doing that very slowly. The overland flow is what we saw in the previous slide. That's what we might call a direct discharge of groundwater. There's a spring here, the groundwater comes out, it goes overland, whether it goes it through, does that through a pipe or, direct or, or directly uh, over, the, over the ground surface, that's a fairly direct discharge to a stream. And it's obvious enough what's going on there. The base flow is a little bit trickier to deal with because we're dealing with groundwater coming up through the surface of the stream and in some ways, with some cases we've seen not necessarily with metals but with nutrients, this can have a very substantial effect on the stream because one of the things we use in classification is the macroinvertebrates, which are down living on the bottom and in the bottom sediments. Well, if that groundwater is not meeting the water quality that is suitable to support the microinvertebrate population needed for that stream classification, they're getting, they're getting it full on. They're not getting it diluted in the stream flow. They're getting that groundwater up through the stream bottom. And we've seen in several cases just microinvertebrate populations wiped out because the groundwater was not suitable for that classification. So we have to have a monitoring program that is going to deal with both of these. Again, the, the direct overland flow, those direct discharges are pretty obviously problematic. How we define discharge within to groundwater within the mining area is a little trickier, uh, but you know we, we think that in the rule we've kind of worked around that. Uh, it's the base flow discharges that become important, and that gets us to some of the, the critical things for how we deal with, with groundwater monitoring within the mining area. So if we go to the next one. So where do we monitor compliance? If there are no standards for groundwater within the mining area, then we have to monitor compliance as close to the down gradient edge of the mining, of any mining area as we possibly can. Uh, recognizing that, that given that this is an industrial site, there simply may be locations that it's not practical to put a monitoring well just because you have vehicle traffic and other things that are going on. That, that you might say, yeah, the mining area ends here, but this is a road. If we put the monitoring well there, we know it's going to get plowed and run over, and so we will, we will put the monitoring well over here. Uh, but as close to, as practically close to it, uh, that down gradient boundary as we can get, again, because we want to capture what is going on with water quality as close to the source of the problem as we can because we don't want to, and certainly the operator doesn't want to either, deal with them any bigger problem than we need to. Um, however, we can 
and they'll be applicant and operator are required to have the have their pollution control technology, essentially liners or other systems, wastewater treatment plants. Those have to be working as designed. So with so even if we are within a mining area, we can require monitoring. We would require monitoring to demonstrate that these things are functioning as they're supposed to. You align you, that although there are no standards for discharges, you're not supposed to have a liner that leaks. So if we see groundwater quality changes that indicate that you are having a liner failure, even though there's not a standard for, that the groundwater has to meet, you're not meeting the standard that your pollution control technology is functioning correctly. Your pollution control technology has failed because if it, if it hadn't, we wouldn't be seeing this change in groundwater quality. Again, this gets how this works given what the criteria that apply within a mining area is somewhat unclear and we have wrestled with that and tried to come up with a solution to that in the rules. Similarly, we would be looking at water quality in, in under drains for impoundments and under drains for waste storage areas. Again, with that same idea that if we see a change in the water quality there, if we see deterioration in the water quality there, that suggests that your containment system has failed. And even though we are within a mining area where no groundwater quality standards apply, something has to be done to address that because you're failing to meet the requirement that your technology operate correctly. So where we have a surface water within a mining area, or for that matter, outside of a mining area, uh, groundwater quality standards are typically based on drinking water. Surface water quality standards are, for the large part, based on suitability to support aquatic life. For any given compound or element, those are, those are very seldom going to be the same. That, uh, in many cases, it's simply because humans have a greater biomass and we're obviously not swimming in it or living in it all, all the whole time. So frequently, the, those standards will be lower for aquatic life than they would be for humans. In some cases, for example, ammonia, there's not a drinking water standard. Uh, you probably wouldn't be drinking water that had ammonia in it anyway. Uh, I certainly wouldn't want to. But there's a fairly sensitive uh, ammonia standard for aquatic life. So to get back to this idea of what's happening, again, with it's very obvious what's going on with the direct discharge, but the indirect discharge from base flow is in some ways what we're really, what we are trying to design this monitoring program to deal with. And so what we're saying there is that we're applying the surface water standards to groundwater at the point that that groundwater discharges into a surface water because that is where you are going to be affecting this potentially very vulnerable, uh, the, the most vulnerable part of the habitat, those animals which are living down in and on the sediment in the bottom of the surface waters, and that therefore you would have the greatest potential to affect the classification of that surface water. Um, and so with, even within a mining area, and outside of the mining area as well, we would be anticipating locating groundwater monitoring points to assess the potential for impact on surface waters. We're not simply looking at the groundwater quality by itself in relation to that GWA standard. We have to recognize that it is, as we saw in that, that hydrologic cycle diagram, it isn't a single integrated system. We have to look at how all the pieces work together. Um, let me see, what did I have next? And when we talk about where, where that compliance boundary is, we have language in there that says it has to be the facility at the time it exists. So you might come in for and propose a waste unit that had a certain dimensions anticipating a 30-year life of the mine. Well, we, we've seen David and Mark talk about you probably are going to be developing that waste unit in, in cells. That you're probably going to be developing some area that will be dewatering over the course of time and then you'll be moving on to another thing. Recognizing that the mine life actually may be greater or lesser than you're looking at, what we have said is, well, your compliance area is that area where you have, is, or the mining area, is based on that area where you have the material that's the potential to discharge, not the area you, you might have material that could be discharging 30 years from now. 
your surface facilities, your footprint might not change over the course of that time. You might you will still have this area that's designated as waste disposal. Your waste treatment facility will, your, your water treatment plant will still stay in the same place. Your mill will still stay in the same place. But because this stockpile or waste disposal area or whatever it is, is expanding over time, your compliance point for groundwater quality is going to be changing over time. So in other words, you don't, if all you end up using is this piece, we're not establishing a compliance point down here, because again, we don't want to be dealing with a bigger problem than we need to be. So the compliance point is going to be as close to that boundary as it possibly can be, recognizing the, the staging of your operations. This, this might be an area that you're using for three or four years. That's fine. When you get ready to move, establish a new monitoring point at the down gradient boundary of the next cell or the next area and we'll transition over. We'll have a transition period to make sure that we're dealing with the same water quality as you go to that next one. But it doesn't, we're not automatically assuming that, that you're going to end up using this entire area for that purpose because you might not. The technology might change, the economy might change, lots of things might happen that could affect how much actually gets used. Another thing commonly comes up is, is in terms of this, how we deal with monitoring frequency. And without going too much into the, into the, the weeds of the statistics here, uh, there are obviously parts of the site where things can change very rapidly. Certainly surface waters, thing, change, things change very rapidly. Um, groundwater things change, tend to not change so rapidly. In most cases, you're dealing with water that's moving at best a couple of feet per day. Uh, in most cases, fractions of a foot per day. One of the important things in, in doing statistical analysis is that you have, your samples are what we call independent, that you're not getting, getting a, a, a codependency frequency. That if I am looking at a value for the concentration of a certain parameter, it can't or it, it, it sort of confuses the analysis if, if some, if you can see it this way, some fraction of that value depends on the value that the previous sample had. There's, there's essentially an overlap between these two measurements, and we want to have no overlap between the two measurements. They need to be close enough together in time that we're not missing significant information, but they need to be far apart enough that they're independent of one another kind of visualize the, the packet of water that's moving along, we want to sample this one, and then we want it to kind of get out of the way before we sample the next one. The faster that's, that water is moving, the more frequently we have to sample. But if it's not moving very fast, we don't need to sample it that often. And in fact, it, it's more difficult if we sample it more frequently than we need to because it creates problems in the analysis. So groundwater typically moving fairly slowly. That's why we look at quarterly sampling in most cases for groundwater. We recognize, and the rules recognize, that there are cases where you would have very permeable units, where you would have significant fracture systems, where you'd have sand and gravel, that just uh, the nature of how rapidly the water might be moving, we might want to sample it more frequently than that. Where those areas are would be determined as part of the pre-development analysis phase. That if in the course of looking at the site we found that there was a that there was a particularly high yield sand and gravel zone that ran through it, we'd say, well, you know, looking at that, that's an area where instead of quarterly, we think you might need to sample every other month or every month. Simply because we know that the groundwater is moving through that area more, rap more rapidly. But most other areas in the site, particularly when we're dealing with fractured bedrock and you're looking at water that is moving fractions of a foot per day, there isn't a need to sample that often. Again, because we don't want to get that kind of overlap. We don't want to get that kind of dependence between our, our variables, or between our, our sampling events. Um, surface waters, again, things happen very rapidly. And so those are cases where we would be looking for continuous monitoring of certain parameters water level, specific conductance, pH, other things to be measured in situ with meters that are, are 
readily available and used by all sorts of people. Uh, we, have, we have a number of them in the department, in fact, that we use to assess surface water quality. And a number of operators who, uh, for various purposes, that, were, that have licenses through us do continuous monitoring of water level and water quality using these kind of meters. Again, because surface water changes really fast. You have to be able to capture those changes. Similarly, there may be cases and sort of things that David was talking about for leak detection systems. If there's a leak, we want to know right away. We don't want to wait three months to find out that there's a liner failure. So that leak detection system, most leak detection systems, would alert somebody immediately. In some cases, uh, again, with a high groundwater table in Maine, many of these uh, liner systems will have groundwater flowing into them all the time. Not, not, not into the liner, rather, but into the underdrain of the liner. Um, ideally, that will be clean groundwater. It will be whatever the ambient groundwater quality is, but we'll know what that is. We'll know what the conductance and the pH and other parameters or the relevant parameters of that groundwater are so that we can be monitoring the outflow from those underdrains, or the applicant, rather, can be monitoring the outflow from those underdrains, and if there is a change, they have to notify the department. So again, if the frequency of the monitoring um, really is tied to, I guess the simplest way to look at it is how rapidly things in what you're monitoring are going to change. In most cases, in ambient groundwater and fractured bedrock, the groundwater is moving very slowly and at any given point, you would anticipate the changes to take place relatively slowly so that we can capture something with less frequent monitoring. But where we have things that are changing relatively rapidly, the quality of, of groundwater seeping through into the underdrains of a lined system, certain parameters of surface water, groundwater under a certain limited cir circumstances, we do anticipate and the rules allow us to require more frequent monitoring where we have those cases. In some cases, in fact, continuous monitoring where the department determines that's appropriate. Ready? That's it, that's it. Question. Let me clarify a couple of things. The, the rules allow, the statute allows, discharge to groundwater within the mining area, but does not allow contamination of groundwater. Is that correct? Contamination is undefined, is, is the one way I think you could look at it. Because the, because the contamination is defined in terms of of those of that suitable for drinking water, color, odor, taste, turbidity, toxicity, all that stuff. By saying that 465 and 470 don't apply within that mining area, we're sort of ambiguous as to what contamination really means. Contamination of groundwater. It's obvious enough where we get to a case where we can say, okay, that groundwater either has a direct discharge where it's bubbling up to the surface someplace within the mining area, or where it's getting into a surface water as, as base flow, as an indirect discharge. There we've got a standard in the statute that says, okay, if, if it causes or contributes to a fit to the surface water not meeting its classification, that's a violation. Outside of mine. Outside or inside. Inside the only, outside the, the drinking water standards also would still apply, and as well as impacts on surface water. Inside the mining area, the only thing that applies is surface water. So, so contamination of, the, the simplest way to look at it, I guess, is that contamination of groundwater within the mining area is defined only in terms of its impact on surface waters and not in terms of the contaminant concentration in the groundwater itself. Obviously, the higher that concentration is, the more potential problem you have to deal with it, and the more of a problem it is for, for the operator when it, it eventually, as it will, migrates outside of the, that defined mining area. Right. So if you're outside the mining area, then, it, then the rules for contamination do apply. Right. Okay. right. We're back does to GWA and GWB outside the mining does area. area. Does that definition, that, and I'm, I'm relating this to the solid waste world, but does that Definition of contamination also include this statistically significant change from up gradient to down gradient, regardless of the drinking water standard? It, it would be it would include a statistically significant change. Um, 
whether, whether it's a change or whether it's a violation takes us back to, this, to, the, to the classification program again. So, we, so ideally, we would like, if, if anything is happening, we would like to catch it at the change stage. And that, that's sort of uh, where what the rules are, are predicated on. We don't want to sort of say, oh, that's elevated. That's interesting. Let's look at it again in a year. Um, if it's elevated, and uh, the rules also do what's called, require what's called confirmation resampling. Um, and the idea of that is that, that, that any lab operator will, will tell you that, that you know, a certain percentage of the, the, set of the samples you analyze simply are going to be wrong. They're going to be outside the laboratory limit. We anticipate that a site, uh, a mining site, is going to have a large number of sampling points. Um, they're sampling for a large number of parameters. Even if you're looking at a, a, a 5 percent uh, error rate is considered pretty good. Um, 1 percent is almost inachievable. But even if you had a 1 percent rate, you're going to get some that will exceed a certain limit. So the rule says if you have that, go back and sample for that parameter again. And the, uh, and if it, if it repeats, then we, we strongly suspect that something is actually there. If it does not, then statistically it says, well, that might have just been an, an outlier. That might have been an error. But we're going to watch that more closely uh, and see if we start to see that. Uh, so again, if you have an increase above background levels, that is confirmed by confirmation resamples and analysis. That's something we want to watch because we don't want that. That's not in anybody's interest for that to turn into into a violation where we would have to potentially have to enforce something where there's a problem we have to deal with. If it's a problem that we can correct with, you know, just operate. How are we how are we loading more onto the trucks? Uh, are we not sweeping the the yard appropriately? Do we have do we have some cross-connection wrong in the drainage program. If it's something that's easy to fix, we want to catch that before it becomes a violation. I guess a couple of things to with. One is, is how, how do you know when there's a violation? If, if, and one of the things that I'm also struggling with, and I don't know if they're related or not, it's just my own experience understanding, if you're disturbing this earth, mm -hmm. if removing earth, you're going to create likely a statistically significant change in groundwater flow chemistry just because of the disturbance. A parking lot will do that. Absolutely. So when you talk about moving you know, your, your compliance point based on the facility operations changing and growing and you know, through the well over here, how are you going to, does your baseline change because you've moved the operation, you establish a new baseline every time you do that? struggle with figuring out, I understand kind of what you're saying, but I don't, I'm trying to figure out how the practicality of that's going to work so that you folks can make a determination whether or not this is going to result in a, in a, in a violation or a problem or not. Yeah. Yeah. And how do you force then the operator to do something about it? Yeah, yeah. and, and, and no. certainly that it's, it, it's a non-trivial problem. Uh, we're, we're, and you know, so anytime you go past a construction site, you can just see at a fill pile there's a lot of iron staining and, and stuff like that. We, and we, we know that. And we know that, that any, any site, um, even if you're not doing that and you're just putting in a new monitoring well someplace, that action is going to disturb the geochemical conditions. And it can take a while for that to clear out of the system. So um, it comes down to two things. We have to characterize. We're looking at background conditions. We're not, and anyway, getting back to your earlier point about upgrading versus downgrading. Um, when we're characterizing the site prior to development, it's not that we're trying to come up with, with an average value of the concentration of each parameter over a site. It's, it's what's representative of this area where you're proposing to do this activity. Um, ideally, where, where you're looking for a, a waste unit or a mill or something like that, 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 that even though the, the concentrations may not be uniform over the whole site, they might be pretty uniform in that piece. And so we're looking at that as as what might be representative in that particular area. Certainly, again, we recognize the fact that, that it's an industrial site that you're building, that you're pushing fill around, that all by itself is going to result in a change to water quality. And as, we, as we've looked at that, um, 
that only has ever been considered, as in my model, we've only ever considered that a problem is if that results in an impact on somebody's well or on a surface water. We know that just pushing dirt around is going to cause a change in groundwater quality. That's, that's a given. That's the nature of, of, of any construction, any earth moving activity. So given that, we're, we're, we're comfortable with the idea of including that in kind of the background noise. And that makes it harder statistically because we have to say, well, what's, it, it makes it basically harder to distinguish what we would say, sig the signal from the noise. It makes it noisier. It makes it harder to work with. But, we work with it. Um, some things that won't be the case. I mean, if you're just pushing soil around, you wouldn't necessarily expect to see, um, you know, a, a, if you're just pushing soil around, you're not going to be increasing your concentration of petroleum hydrocarbons by doing that. So if we see petroleum hydrocarbons, we kind of know where that's from. If you're talking about iron, manganese, other things that are extremely common in the soils of Maine, if you know, we, we would expect around a developed area to see those go up. But again, that's the purpose of the upgradient monitoring well. We shouldn't see that change there. If we do, something is going on, maybe not at the site, but something is going on that we need to take a closer look at. Um, and that, that really is the purpose of an upgradient well. It, it's not necessarily that you're comparing that the water here is the same as the water down there. It's that can we catch those influences that that maybe we're wrong about what's up gradient and what's down gradient, or influences that are taking place due to something else that's happening outside, outside the area um, that we can compare it to. Um, that we'd be looking at different areas of the site. You're doing different things in different areas. So you'll have some areas where you might have more activity going on than others. Well, we'd expect just, again, just because you're pushing dirt around, you're going to see some parameters increase in that area. We can compare those to other wells on the site and say, okay, what's, what's the range of difference between these two? Does this look like it's kind of consistent with you know, this change that's going on in this area where they're handling ore? Is that pretty consistent with what's happening in this area where they built the parking lot? It should be, as long as there's no additional discharge from the ore. So again, if they're, if they're going up, but what's happening in a site, in a section of the site that you're handling a class A and class B waste is what's happening consistent with the site where you're just doing something that essentially is pushing dirt around. Okay, we know what's going on there. If this is very different from what's happening in this other part of the site, then we gotta look more closely at that. As to the question of what, what is a violation and what, how we enforce it, I'll turn that over to these guys. <laughs> What you just gone through is a very typical scenario of how you want the ground wall around landfills and stuff like that. What happens when you go in between those ground wells, water wells, and you lower the water a thousand feet, because that's how far down you are? What impact does that have you know, on the validity of the wells you're actually trying to monitor? Yeah, that uh, certainly things that can happen. Uh, you know, and, and one thing that we, we look for but well, certainly changing, changing water level all by itself can have a significant effect on water quality. We, we see this not frequently, but we have seen it sometimes where um, excavations have lowered water level as they basically, when, when you construct a pond, basically you're raising the water level on one end and lowering it on the other end, really. Um, and you'll have an iron pan or something like that, that has been, that's below water, and so under one set of geochemical conditions, and then when you drop the water level, it's exposed, and it's in a different set of geochemical conditions. Well, you'll see iron concentrations go up. You'll see other concentrations of other things go up. What I'm getting at is, maybe you're physically lowering the water table, well, because you need water in your mind while you're throwing that down. Yeah. You might put a monitoring well down, you know, 400 feet, 500 feet, whatever you think is necessary, but then all of a sudden the water drops 500 feet below that. Part of the, the mine design would be that we would require of an applicant and, and that would, that an applicant would do for their own potential anyway is to try and, and estimate what the, the bulk permeability of the rock mass would be because they need to know that simply in order to size the pumps. And they need to have an estimate of how much water they're going to be pumping out of the mine every day, uh, not just for sizing their pumps, but because they need to know how much water they need to treat. So they're going so a, a sort of three-dimensional model of what happens to the groundwater table as the mine develops is going to be, you know, would, would be 
standard, a standard procedure for any intelligent mine operator to do, whether or not we require it or not, and we certainly would require it. So that would look at going in as part of the background phase and model says, okay, what do we what do we have here now? What what is how much water moves through the site? How fast is it going? Where does it go? Um, what happens when we dig a big hole here? If we do that, a hole of this diameter and this depth and these associated workings, we can simulate that in the model and look at how much water we have to deal with. And that the, an operator will get a number from that that will tell them how big they have to design their treatment plant, or, or conversely, that, that we need to grout or cement or do something else as we, as we proceed in order to minimize the amount of water coming in. It, it's, I mean, the model is not simply for, for our purposes. It's really for as much as anything else for the operator to know how much water they're going to have to deal with because they're going to have to pump it out of the mine and they potentially have to treat it. So, so that information is, is a very important economic consideration and, and, and certainly what the operator wants is that they shouldn't see. They, they don't want to see a significant change in the water level uh, except right in areas where they're excavating because, again, that means more water that they have to deal with, certainly pumping it out of the workings and potentially treating it. So, so that kind of... That would be part of the analysis we do in the background. Uh, a lot's going to depend there on, on other criteria. The, uh, what the, the depth and the nature of the overburden, for example, what the, where the water supply, where, where adjacent water supply wells would be and how deep those go. Uh, that, that specific problem is not that different from ones we deal with with quarries now. And so, so typically we do look at what, you know, when you're, when you're taking the floor of a quarry down below sea level, you, this is Maine, it's wet. You have surface water resources all around that. The Dragon Quarry floor is hundreds of feet below a fairly substantial stream that runs right next to it. And the reason for, there are two reasons for that. That rock is very tight and there's a substantial deposit of clay on top of that rock. So that's holding up that stream and the rate of leakage through the bottom of that clay and into the bedrock is really very slow. Uh, we have other sites where there are quarries where there's not much in the way of overburden. So, so we are looking at, and the, the operator is looking at, as, as we get closer to, to these wells, as we get closer to this stream, what's starting to happen there and what's the plan for if we do see a statistically significant change in stream flow or well water level or, or whatever based on that. Do we, does that affect the depth of operation? Do we supplement stream flow from someplace? Do we provide alternate water supplies for people? And so so that, that piece of, of what happens to the water level as the excavation proceeds, uh, it, it's, that narrow slice is one that we, we deal with fairly frequently. Uh, the water quality of it, you know, when we're dealing with 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 sulfide mining, is different. But you don't have deeper than normal. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the Adonis is about the uh, life you know, a couple hundred feet. Yeah. These mines do go down. I know one shot we were involved in years ago went down uh, almost three thousand feet. So oh yeah. That would that would not be uncommon. To, to some extent, the deeper you go, the tighter the rock gets. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, we can. Right. Well, it, it's it's any of these. I, we, we can do. Any of these are going to evolve over time, and as, and as I say, it's it's in the operator's interest to know what they're going to run across. They don't suddenly want to be dealing with 100 gallons a minute coming into the mine. So so they're going to be doing exploration work and, and doing modeling and assessing conditions ahead of time. And if they know that that's there, they're going to have a, a operation in place to grout that set of fractures pretty quickly. That doesn't say that, that you won't run across that because you can't capture everything in an exploration program. But part of the contingency planning would be what happens if your pumps fail? What happens if the inflow exceeds the amount that you're, you're rating for your that you're looking at for your pumps. Um, so that that 
some level of planning for that would be there, whether or not necessarily that's what's showing up in the applicant's model or not. Um, and you know, again, we've we've looked at um, you know when we looked at the um, I believe uh, some of the earlier phases of Bald Mountain. There's a significant as you as you know from that area, there are substantial wetlands there, and they were looking at excavating certainly below the level of that. And what happens to that wetland when you excavate below that level was was something that we were looking at and that we were looking at in their model. Uh, the uh, the BHP Utah deposit up near the Forks uh, was adjacent to a lake. So part of the, the bulk sampling project for that was to develop a model that said, okay, we're, we're putting in a shaft that's this deep and this big around. Uh, it obviously is a zone of very high permeability. What happens to groundwater flow when we poke that in next to the lake? Are we, do we reasonably anticipate seeing a high flow into that as we pump it out and keep it dry. And, and as important as that, what, so obviously we're going to see some decline in water levels in and adjacent to the excavation, sort of how far out from that goes. What? I think I think ultimately you go back to the criteria for approval and if there's an unacceptable or an unreasonable impact, then the permit will be denied. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the, it's a summary. Yeah. I'm going to have upgrading quality and downgrading quality. You may not have upgrading quality or downgrading quality if you hold the table in between and be yeah. enough. Or you may have quality that changes with the depth significantly. So yeah. it seems like you're almost a moving target. Yeah, it, it can be. And, and certainly there, 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 we think that there are provisions for that, that basically if a, if a site is no longer providing valid data, whether that's because of physical damage to the well or whether it's because climatic changes or operational changes have resulted in that well not being usable, you have to replace it. Um, assuming it's suitable, it, it might be being abandoned because you know, you're expanding a facility into that area, in which case, fine, you replace it with another one. But, but if it's for other reasons not supplying usable data anymore, if those are data we think we need, you have to provide an alternate source of those data. I just want to ask a question uh, about an issue that was raised throughout the comments that were received, and that is um, the argument that the sulfur content or the arsenic content could be so great in certain of these ore bodies that all of these safeguards, notwithstanding, we're going to end up with a significant groundwater and surface water problem. Where in the process does that issue get grappled with? If you don't have a, some, um, some of these folks, commenters, who have argued for some sort of a standard in the rule, that absent a standard in the rule about uh, no-go conditions are uh, meet certain thresholds, where in this process would that issue get dealt with? Is it that waste characterization early on in the exploration phase? Or is it just trying to design things at the very end in hopes that you can contain? Well, the, I think obviously you want to get the, to address that as early as possible. And I, I fortunately just happen to have Marshall McLuhan with me right here. Um, so I'll turn that over. I think Melanie has that language, or does Jeff have that language? Well, there's, I, I think there's, there's several points. Oh, sorry about that. I get used to hearing my booming voice without it. There you go. Uh, I think there's several, several decision points. I mean, throughout the application process, the permit approval criteria, uh, where that enters in. Uh, I'd submit one of the, you know, more obvious places is in the alternatives analysis uh, section of the application where the applicant uh, basically needs to submit a an analysis of the alter alternatives uh, and this is going to be incorporated into our determination of whether or not a project or a proposal is going to unreasonably or adversely impacting impact the environment uh, so that is that is a decision point should there be a cut and dried go no go i mean again this is a, a topic that has come up 
over the years a number of times. Uh, I'm not sure what that number should be. Uh, you know, perhaps, perhaps you, you establish a rebuttable presumption that above some certain threshold, some concentration of sulfur, that uh, an applicant would have to conclusively demonstrate a higher burden of proof, if you will, that a project will not pose an unreasonable impact or have an unreasonable impact. I don't know whether it should be a, a true go or no go. I don't know that we have the statutory authority to, to establish a go, no go. I think we can, and I'm looking at Mary, uh, use a rebuttable presumption that above some threshold, whatever it might be, uh, that a project would, would pose a significant risk and therefore an applicant would, would really need to go that extra mile to, to demonstrate to the department and the public that you know, his, his project is not going to pose an unreasonable uh, threat to the environment or public health. It's my thoughts on that. Sure. That, that uh, enlightened the fact that prior to any mining activity, the fish, the fowl, the mammals, the everything around the earthworms for that matter, what are their levels of arsenic? That just living on the mountain, in or near the mountain, etc. Uh, because here again, it's one of these things, those are the levels that are there. Now the question is, can the permittee uh, demonstrate that they have a way to reduce that, geochemically or otherwise, so that the actual levels of arsenic, for instance, that get into groundwater or even surface water are reduced because of some geochemical technique. They can't do that. And if they, those levels are higher than you normally find in the fish, the, the and fowl, and so on, then uh, then you did, I'm not sure what you do. You just basically say you haven't demonstrated to our satisfaction that you're going to reduce, uh, let alone or stay the same, but reduce the levels. I think that's a good point. I, I think that an applicant really really would need to demonstrate that his project, I mean, in the case, and we'll use the surface water and the fish, the wildlife, that it's not going to result in an increase in arsenic or whatever, whatever metal or other, whatever uh, other contaminant that might be released. And, you know, I think if they can't do that, we can't issue a permit. I mean, it doesn't meet the criteria of the Mining Act. It is not protecting the public health. Uh, at, at some point, it is unreasonable. And I guess just what I'm suggesting is, just food for thought is, is this idea of a rebuttable presumption. We have similar provision in our uh, wind power rules for scenic impacts. Uh, so just just a, a requirement that an application might take that or be needed to, uh, or required, if you will, to take that extra step, really conclusively demonstrate uh, at a high, high degree of burden, or if you will, or high degree of proof that a project is not going to unreasonably impact the environment or public health. If you can, if you can prove to us you can do this, then you've satisfied that hurdle. Yes. Would you be in a position to uh, specify what a concentration might be? Uh, you indicated initially in your initial response that you didn't know what that number might be. I think it's certainly, yes, I think, I think Cindy, it's certainly something we can develop. There's been uh, a lot of comments submitted on this over the past few years. Uh, I certainly wouldn't want to put a put a number out there right now. I'd, I'd have to leave that to our true technical experts. Well, I don't know if you need to put a number out there, Jeff, because the value of the resource is going to determine what the developer is willing to invest to accomplish that. It becomes a very difficult thing, and it's going to cost a significant amount of money because of a special circumstance. Then the developer has to make that call they also have to post the additional money with the state to protect what's going on. So 
I don't know if you can set because if you had a very minimal uh, uh, resource, a very minimal amount of contamination may totally derail you. If you have a massive resource, then you may have the revenue to deal with it. So I don't know how you could ever set an arbitrary number. Uh, those are points of concern which have to be addressed. So you have to make sure they address them to the satisfaction of the department. But setting a limit, I don't know if it's even doable. I you think you'll have a target of what you don't want to allow. Yeah, exactly. I think that's a, a good point. I know that there there has been some research over the over the years looking at, at certain sulfur concentrations and at what point, uh, you know, from universities, if you will, uh, what point, you know, are, is, is, is acid rock drainage uh, extremely difficult or a very high hurdle? Again, uh, we'd have to look at some of that and get back to you with just kind of some thoughts on it. Well, you may also find that applicant A coming to decide that applicant A wants to uh, get a permit at some point uh, is going to be required to do under exploration, et cetera, a series of wells for checking, or and a very large net of them, I would, I would imagine, to, to, to let us know what is the status of contamination in the groundwater at the site. And then, we haven't got there yet, we probably won't before lunch, but use some consultants or third party inspectors or somebody else, including the DEB, of course, to go out and then do their own sampling uh, in the wells that have been put in by the applicant, perhaps, uh, and just to make sure the numbers seem to be the same. And then now you know what the contamination level for whatever the uh, whatever the material may be, uh, sulfur or, or anything, uh, now you know what those levels are. Now that gives you a good feeling that you do not want the applicant to exceed those levels. Now that includes dissection of fish and fowl and other et cetera, because what's in their tissues? Not so much exactly what's in the water, because how much of that actually gets into that part of the ecosystem, so the animals have also need to be tested. You go fishing uh, to catch yourself a nice fish for lunch, uh, you don't have any clue how much you're getting with any of those contaminants, potential contaminants. I think you get it right there because you don't do the original work. The original work gets done by the applicant. Exactly, and I think it's fair to say that the, the applicant and then the department will both have a very good idea of what a project is facing long before a, a full application is, is filed early in the process. I know that in uh, one of the several books that uh, I've read over the years from John Cummings, there are numbers that uh, he's included in his books, particularly arsenic numbers and others, and I'm sure they're floating about in various internet suggestions of one person and another, but just a perfectly good example, he basically found the location uh, as a function of the chemistry, the geochemistry. And so uh, his numbers should, and his techniques, which he suggested, should also be given rather serious consideration, even though the applicants are own mining uh, company, not the exploration company, the mining company itself, or the applicants, you can't really try to tell them how best to do their job so long as they meet our standards. But uh, here again, there are numbers out there that are quite useful in techniques as well. I have uh, one additional question regarding groundwater. Um, in his comments, Dr. Peter Garrett, who was a hydrogeologist, as you know, with the department that worked on remediation of contaminated wells, uh, commented that he felt the setback of a thousand feet from a public water supply of, of any of these units was insufficient. And I didn't know, don't know whether you've had a chance to think about that or not. Um, well, what's your thoughts on And I, I believe the rule sets it as a minimum setback of 1,000 feet from a public water supply. I, I may ask David to come up and give me a hand, but we'll, 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 we'll give this a shot. Uh, yeah, we have a 1,000 foot setback requirement from public drinking water supplies, and I think it's in Section 20B2, I think. 
Uh, and in that same section, so, so a mining operation would need to be 1,000 feet from the public drinking water supply. This is actually the same as the setback requirements we have for uh, oil facilities, I believe, in our oil rules. Uh, that's, and that's in statute. Uh, we also have in that same section of the rule uh, provisions that we can require a greater setback if we determine that it is necessary. So really a thousand feet is just a minimum setback. If we review an application, we review a site, we look at the project, and that setback really needs to be greater, or if it poses an unreasonable impact on the public drinking water supply, uh, that's a no-go right there, if you will. So essentially, um, if there were, say, a tailings impoundment and someone wanted to have situated just a thousand feet from a public water supply, the rule gives you a way to identify that as perhaps too great a risk to that public water supply, and therefore, not allowed. Certainly. Good? I mean, the first step would be for, for the applicant to, to demonstrate that it's not going to impact the public water supply uh, in the event that we weren't comfortable or we didn't agree with the applicant's technical materials, then we could, could request and seek a, a greater distance, you know, reciting of that impoundment. Thank you. I would like to uh, relatively briefly go over some of the financial assurance uh, concerns. I don't believe there were a ton, but there's a couple. And then uh, I think we're going to be discussing the use of consultants and independent third-party investigators, where we have them, and maybe some thoughts for the future. So we'll be back uh, on 15.